We're here today to talk about five ways violent video games affect children. Pay attention to this. As a professional psychologist, I've been trying to pay attention to what are the actual psychological effects of violent video games on our kids. Let's start with the obvious thing, desensitization. This is a psychological process that happens to all of us anytime we have repeated exposure to something. You know, one of the most obvious examples of this I learned when my kids were teenagers and the room started to smell a little funny. You know, they'd leave dirty socks around or whatever it is. Well, that smell is something that we would notice as soon as we walked into the room, but because they had been sitting in there for hours, they had desensitized themselves to it. Another word for this is habituation. And it's the way that our senses with repeated exposure to something, start to become less sensitive to that thing. This is what happens with violent video games. We are desensitized to what's going on in that game. So at first it might be very alarming or shocking or oh, and then after repeated exposure to that, we become desensitized to it. There's a little poem that was written by Alexander Pope years ago that I think captures this very nicely. Let me just share that with you. Vice is a monster of so frightful mean as to be hated needs but to be seen. Yet seen too oft, familiar with her face, we first endure, then pity, then embrace. I think Alexander's poem really captures what we're talking about with desensitization as it's shocking at first and then tolerated and then finally just completely accepted. That's important because some of the content of violent video games is something we don't necessarily want our kids to be embracing. So let's pay attention to that. Along the lines of desensitization, another factor I'm going to call normalization. And it happens in conjunction with desensitization, but it takes it a step farther, where it seems or appears or is perceived to be normal. The most striking example of this, I think, was demonstrated by Dr. George Stratton. This was clear back in the 1800s. In 1896, George Stratton wrote a paper about an experience he had in developing a pair of eyeglasses that turned everything upside down. He was studying human perception. He wanted to see what would happen. People thought he was nuts, so they didn't even sign up for the study. He put them on himself, and as you can imagine, after putting these glasses on that made everything upside down, he had a hard time getting through his own home. Can you imagine even just filling up a cup of water at the sink? Crazy, right? Well, after a while, he got used to it. This is the desensitization that I was talking about earlier. He got used to it. It wasn't as shocking or alarming now. It was something that he was starting to get used to. And then on day eight, something really remarkable happened. And this blew everyone's mind when he reported it. It was no longer upside down. It looked normal to him. Not just that he was used to it, it looked normal to him, which kind of freaked him out too. So he took the glasses off at that point and everything was upside down. He had to adjust back. Our mind does this. I call it normalization where whatever we perceive over a period of time looks normal to us. That doesn't mean that's the way the world is. It simply looks normal to us because that's what we've gotten used to. Repeated exposure to violent video games can make that look normal. And it's not. You think about how our society operates. It is not normal to do the violent actions that are portrayed in video games. 
but with enough exposure, it starts to look normal. That's a little scary. The third way that violent video games can affect children, or anyone really, we're talking about kids today, but I think the same principles apply to adults. So let's just be careful about that as well. The next thing has to do with addiction. And you've probably heard that video games can be addicting. There are actually features that are built into video games. The game developers know this and they can tell you about it. I attended a conference. I think they were talking about Twitch and I can't even remember all of the terms, but they, they have specific terms that they have identified that make it hard to stop because the objective is to keep people playing, right? Well, these same factors that are built into the video games can actually make them highly addictive. And one of the reasons that that is true, this is true of substances as well. Anything that quickly changes your mood can become addictive. And it's the mood change that is the addictive factor there. So when people get involved in video games, especially intense video games or violent or explicit video games, it changes their mood. And then it requires more and more of that input to get the same mood effect. And it, it starts an addictive pattern. So they can actually be addictive. The fourth way that violent video games can affect children doesn't even have anything to do with the violence. In fact, this is something that we see with almost all types of screen time. It's consumption, meaning consumption of time and energy and resources. A lot of people are surprised when we show them a printout or a report of how much time they have actually spent on a particular game or screen time. In fact, you can do this with your own device. Most smartphones now have a feature where you can get a screen time report for that device. Just open it up. It's probably in your settings where you can take a look at how much screen time have I spent and it will break it down into the different apps. When we really realize how much time it's consuming, I think this is one of the concerns. Forget about the violence for just a minute, which I'm very personally concerned about. But even if we set the violence aside, how much time is this consuming? Time that could be used in other productive activities. And I know this is something that I consult with parents a lot about too, because they're concerned about the sheer amount of time that is consumed by these video games. It's a real factor. Let's take a look at it. And finally, I want to get to a point that I learned personally several years ago. In fact, I wrote about it in my book and I want to read to you just a little section from my book on page 162, where I told the story of Charlie Wakamatsu and I were on a business trip together. Charlie's one of the founders of a nonprofit that helps to teach kids principles in the schools. It's called Nova Principles. I'll just pick up where I recorded this in the book. Charlie asks if I'd like to go bowling on this business trip. Well, it sounds like fun, so I agree. Charlie decides to make it more interesting, which means there's a bet involved. He proposes that the loser buys dinner. It's a pretty safe bet for him. He's a fairly regular bowler. I, on the other hand, have been bowling maybe five times in 10 years, so Yes, I'm probably buying dinner. Well, a few frames into the first game, I noticed that things are not going so well for him. They are, however, going remarkably well for me. I finished the game with my all-time high score, which is a solid 30 points better than my previous personal best. I thought you said you haven't been playing, Charlie challenges me. I haven't, I replied defensively. I haven't bowled in. Then I realize I have been bullying on our Wii game system. I didn't think about that when I'd said I hadn't been bullying because it's just a video game that I play with my kids on a television in our living room. The virtual game, however, apparently provided repeated mental practice that transferred surprisingly well to the real game. Charlie buys dinner. <laughs> 
The victory rings somewhat hollow though because we're on the same expense account for the trip. I wanted to share that little story with you from my book because I learned from this experience that virtual practice is practice. And it translated for me into winning, decidedly winning, two bowling games in a row, which surprised me. It surprised Charlie. But I had been practicing on a video game. I still remember with horror how I felt the morning of September 11th when hijackers crashed planes into some very prominent buildings here in the United States of America and how I felt about that. I, I later learned that these men had practiced those attacks virtually in video games, on simulators. It's how we practice. What are we practicing with our video games? I know, I get it all the time. It's just a game. I get that. It's just a game. But what are we practicing? What skill sets are we developing in engaging our time and effort that way? This is another way that violent video games affect kids. I'll call it the practice effect. Let's take a serious look at this. I'm not saying that all games are bad or that all violent games are bad. I do think that it has a profound effect and I think it's worth taking a look at. Sometimes I get in trouble for telling people the truth about the effects of things like violent video games. Hopefully you got some helpful pointers and tips there. If you want to engage in a positive community that takes things like this seriously, come join us at Live On Purpose Central. Go .liveonpurposecentral.com. Her head was down, face locked onto the phone.